Nigeria, unique, fascinating, a country of multiple tribes, cultures, religions, and expressions, a country full of promise. On January 1st, 2014, Nigeria will mark 100 years since the amalgamation of the North and the South to form one country. How did this melting pot of diverse people, language and culture become one nation? How did this vast territory with artificial borders become one country? Evidence of civilization traces back as far as the 8,000-year-old Dufuna Kano with the most sophisticated design of its time, discovered in present-day Borno State. Similarly, the terracotta art of the Nok people reveal an advanced culture thriving in the area now called Kaduna State. Before the Europeans ever set foot on West African soil, the territory that makes up present-day Nigeria was dominated by independent empire and city-states. From the great Khan and Bornu Empire, which expanded through long-distance trade and military technology, to the Igbo Kuo civilization, the first bronze casters in Africa, who sourced materials from as far away as Egypt. From the thousand-year-old Benin Empire, with its infrastructure and far-reaching diplomatic links, to the formidable military and administrative machine of the vast Oyo Empire and the power of the great Sokoto Caliphate in the 19th century under the legendary Sheikh Usman Danfodio. These pre-colonial states were highly organized societies with evolved administrative systems, courts, diplomatic functions, educational centers, and successful methods of commerce and agriculture. Rulers expanded their economies through trade and sometimes expanded their trade through war. Amina, the warrior queen, through her military conquest, made Zazao, now Zaria, the center of the North-South Saharan and East-West Sudan trade in the 16th century. Amina was also the originator of the earthen walls that fortified Zaria and other cities that she conquered, such as Kano. Trade network stretched as far as Europe and the Middle East, and by the time the Portuguese landed on the coast of Benin in the late 15th century, West Africans had been trading with foreign nations for 400 years. The Portuguese explorers were soon followed by the British, French and Dutch. First, they came for our pepper, palm oil, ground nuts, cocoa, cloth, beans and ivory. Then, they came for our people. 25 million men, women and children seized and shipped to work as slaves in the cotton fields of the Americas, the deserts of Arabia, the farms and factories of Europe and the plantations of the West Indies. Three Africans also became part of European society, most famously, Olauda Equiano, the first African to write a novel. His celebrated autobiography published in 1789. Taken as a slave from Igbo land, Equiano eventually bought his freedom, worked all over the world and married an English lady. There was also ex-sailor Captain James Labulo Davis, a London-based Yoruba millionaire who arrived with 16 gold carriages for his wedding in 1861 to Sarah Forbes Bonita, the adopted African goddaughter of Queen Victoria. After the legal abolition of the slave trade in 1807, the British used a combination of religion, commerce and politics to secure trading advantages for British companies. When the indigenous rulers proved uncooperative, British diplomacy often gave way to British gunboats. This was seen when a British naval force entered Lagos Bay in December 1861, deposed the king and installed a more pliable ruler and eventually annexed Lagos as the first crown colony in Nigeria, now governed directly from Britain. However, the path to British rule did not always run smooth. 
Nigerians from north to south, east to west, fought valiantly to preserve their freedom. We salute heroes like the former slave from Amibo, the most prosperous city-state in the Delta region. His name was Jaja, King of Opobo. He received a sword of honor in 1875 from Queen Victoria after Opobo soldiers helped the British in the Gold Coast. But when British exclusionist policies began to threaten the livelihood of local traders, Jaja's vigorous opposition became a deep thorn in the flesh of imperial ambitions. Afraid of the influential king, the British lured Jaja onto a ship and gave him an ultimatum, surrender himself or face the bombardment of Opobo by naval forces. He was deported to the West Indies, never to see his beloved Opobo again. We salute the indomitable chief, Nana Ulumu, who valiantly protected the economic and political independence of the Shekiri Kingdom for more than 10 years, until 1894, when he too was forcibly deported for being a threat to colonial interests. We salute the great Oba Ovarami of Benin, who resisted British attempts to take over his trade routes, even banning them from entering his territories. In 1897, after a punitive expedition to Benin, the great Oba was forced into exile in Calabar, while the British regiment looted the ancient city's priceless treasures. Nigeria is still negotiating for their return today. We salute the brave Ekumeku resistance movement, a secret army of thousands of Igbo warriors who use conventional and innovative guerrilla warfare to take down Royal Niger Company outposts in the southeast. Even as late as 1909, the Ekumeku were instrumental in defending the town of Ogwashuku from colonial invasion. We salute the courageous Sultan Muhammadu Atahiru I, who after the sacking of Sakoto Caliphate, continued to fight British invasion, leading his warriors on horseback against their cannons until he died in battle at Brumi in 1903. The Treaty of Berlin of 1884 had divided approximately 10,000 African states into 52 countries, shared amongst the European powers. Britain expanded its interest through the powerful trade conglomerate, the Royal Niger Company, formerly United Africa Company, UAC, headed by Sir George Topman Goldie, a man so instrumental that at a time, the British considered naming the country Goldesia in his honor. The British were desperate to control trade routes because in the 19th century, the volume and economic value of agricultural export by independent Nigerian states was much greater than that of Britain. Using military might and reneging on trade agreements at every turn, the Royal Niger Company seized control of the Delta region, took over key western states like Ijebu and Abiokuta and spread north, where technocrat and army officer Frederick Lugard transformed the RNC's commercial influence into British political control. Continuing the British policy of indirect rule, Lugard disposed uncooperative rulers and installed new emirs and leaders in their place. Some went on to do great things. Sariki Katsina Muhammad Diko, installed by the British in 1901, set up new administrative structures, promoted commerce and education, founding Katsina, later Barewa College and the first school for girls, and was also the first Northern Emir to go on the Hajj and to fly in a plane. In 1900, Calabar became the capital of the new protectorate of South and Nigeria, while Zungeru became capital of the new protectorate of North and Nigeria. In 1906, the Lagos colony and the protectorate of South and Nigeria were merged with Lagos as the capital. Between 1900 and 1914, the protectorates made impressive economic gains, all of which now went to the British Empire. The cocoa and granite trade were booming, 
Tin and Co. were discovered in Joss and Enugu respectively. The Lagos Canal railway lines were built and the construction of a port in Ikwere Potaket expanded the export trade. These new opportunities were exploited by astute Nigerians like wealthy granite trader Alaji Al Hassan Dantata, multi millionaire transport and shipping magnate Sir Louis Odumegu Ojuku, who later became founding member and first president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and Candido da Rocha, who made a fortune selling water and whose former mansion in Lagos still stands fittingly named Water House. A growing crop of Nigerian professionals had also emerged from trailblazers like the first Nigerian doctor, Nathaniel King, who qualified in 1875, and the first lawyer, Christopher Sakbara Williams, called to bar in 1879, to George Adebayo Agbebi, who qualified as the first Nigerian engineer in 1911, and Miss Aurel Lua Green, the first African female pharmacist. Some became political leaders like England-educated Prince Basse Duke Ephraim, who led a delegation of the Calabar people to London in 1913 to make representations on land tenure reform. This professional class became the forefront, a new nationalist movement led by Herbert Macaulay, grandson of the first African bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowther, who raised political awareness through his newspaper, the Lagos Daily News. On January 1, 1914, Britain amalgamated the two protectorates, spanning 330,000 square miles into one Nigeria. The creation of Nigeria was no random accident or political whim. As now Governor General, Lugard stated in his amalgamation speech, His Majesty's government, after long and mature consideration, arrived at the conclusion that it would be to the great advantage of the countries known as South and North in Nigeria that they should be amalgamated into one government, conforming to one policy and mutually cooperating for the moral and material advancement of Nigeria as a whole. Amalgamation changed the way we as Nigerians saw ourselves. It inspired those who believed in the possibility of a different future and who in turn inspire the men and women that drove that train of self-determination to its final stop at independence. And along this journey, we became truly Nigerian. Not just in name, but in our hearts. In the course of our rich history, we have seen the heights of greatness and the depths of cruelty. We have seen the birth of new civilizations and the death of ancient empires. Our testimony is this. We were beaten, but never broken. Subdued, but never conquered. Today, we are many, yet we are one people, one nation, forever united by a shared struggle, a common heritage, and a bright future. We are Nigerians. Standing tall, standing tall. We 